Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we're going to be muted. <laughs> See you all, all right. later. Well, or not. If they're not going to mute us, maybe we should mute ourselves. Yeah. Let's. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Friends, it's good to see everyone here and uh, good to be in this gathered meeting. Friends online, thank you so much for inviting us into your homes and living rooms and uh, just uh, coffee space area, uh, areas. Uh, it's good to have, uh, good to see you and good to have you here. So uh, uh, Mike and Tricia, we see you there. Doug, we see you as well. And uh, we see various, uh, various names of, of our dear friends, Suzanne and Brian and Will. They are tuning in from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So good to see that you, that you made it in there. Uh, so we celebrate that. Well, friends, we're going to go ahead and let's uh, uh, take a moment to just recenter. And I'll open us up with a brief word of prayer. Let's find our center, friends. Loving God, we are compelled by your love and drawn close to you. And it is out of silence, Lord, that we uh, hear your still small voice that speaks tender words of encouragement, uh, words of truth, words that move us uh, into that trusting relationship that we have by faith. Christ, I ask that your spirit uh, would speak tenderly to us and that our hearts and minds would be open to your motion of love. We are grateful for this gathered meeting. We are grateful for uh, the people in whom, uh, in whom you abide. And we are grateful for your presence in this place. Lord, we thank you. We pray these things, Christ, in your name. Amen and amen. All right, friends. Shirley?
I'm trying to get up here before the music team sits down. This is our time to get up and greet one another. <laughs> so let's do that. And did you sense it? I, was, I thought we were on the verge of clapping on that last song. So, uh, you know, let's go ahead <laughs> in the spirit of joy, in the spirit of fellowship and communion. Let's greet one another in the Lord. And friends online, we love to see you. We're going to go ahead and put your picture up as well so we can see you. Uh, online. Just FYI, Zoom is online. Yep. Good to see you, Doug. Good to see you, Conleys. Good to see you, Brian. All right, we're going to try to give it about 30 more seconds, and then we'll find our seats. <laughs> Let's see, I think I'll need that down. Yeah. Yeah, make sure that, make sure that's kind of below you, because okay. they're going to be, the camera's up there and up oh, there, and you okay. don't want this in the middle of your face. Oh, okay. So make sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and find our seats, dear friends. The scripture today is Acts 27, 21 through 28, 2. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. You should have set sail from Crete and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor and indeed God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it'll be exactly as I have been told. But we will have to run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were drifting across the sea of Adria, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found 20 phantoms. A little farther on, they took soundings again and found 15 phantoms. Fearing that we might run her on the rocks, they let us down four anchors from the stern and prayed for a day to come. 
But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day, and you have been in suspense and remaining without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he said this, he took bread and gave, giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged and took food for themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. After they had satisfied their hunger, they lightened the ship by throwing the wheat into the sea. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore, if they could. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that tied the steering oars. Then host, hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none may swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept him from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. After we had reached safety, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us unusual kindness. Since it had begun to rain and was cold, they kindled the fire and welcomed all of us around it. Okay, after that reading, we need to give Beth a hand, a round of applause. <laughs> Not only is Beth an amazing uh, scripture reader, uh, I love the sound of your cadence and your voice, but that was, I think that sets a new precedent of uh, scripture readings for Sunday morning. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we were given. And so we're going we're gonna to stick with it and, and roll with it. But uh, as you could kind of reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the story, it's the story of Paul, who is then in prison, of the Apostle Paul, the missionary. He's imprisoned, and he's on a ship, and things have gone really wrong on the ship. And, you know, it, what ensues is, you know, well, the, uh, the rest of the scripture. It's interesting that stories like that are are in scripture. It's just, it's this narrative of, of, a, of uh, you know, what everything, what could possibly go wrong on a ship happening uh, with a, an apostle of Christ being there on the ship and how that's, you know, the Christian, the Christian community recognize that as, as scripture and as God speaking and talking to us through that. So let me say this. As I was preparing for today's message this week, I had a profound insight about <clears throat> a profound insight about the Bible. That insight is that I am persuaded that the stories of the Bible can be blamed for reality television shows. <laughs> Especially after reading something like that. It's reality TV all over again. But 2,000 years ago, I say this tongue in cheek, of course. Um, honestly. Uh, however, Scripture does teach that if you want to persuade others, if that's your goal is persuasion, persuasion, persuasive uh, uh, speech, and if you want to attempt to win someone over to just consider your perspective on any given subject, how do you do that? 
uh, scripture would say, tell a compelling story. Tell a story. Don't try to argue it, but tell a good story. Even better, if you can tell a compelling story where people can participate within that story, that's even better. It's one thing to just tell a story out of, you know, for the sake of entertainment. It's another to tell a story where the hearers say, oh, hey, I want to be, can I be a part of that? <laughs> and there's an invitation that says yes, yes. The ability to speak to the soul of people through story is a powerful method of teaching, and it often leads to spiritual formation and even moral and ethical instruction, the power of stories. Did you notice how today's, and, and you might want to kind of keep, if you have a scripture on your phone or iPad or uh, online or in, in uh, the analog version, the Bible, uh, you might want to kind of keep referring back to it because I wanted to talk about some of the details that rose from this, this, this lengthy narrative. And did you notice how today's scripture, uh, scripture readings, it, it offers no theological treaty. This isn't theology per se. This is just narrative. It's just a story. There's no kind of theo uh, cerebral theological discourse Instead, we are given the dramatic account of Paul's survival of a storm at sea. It's a story of a, so of a storm at sea. What Paul did, what Paul experienced, what the people on this boat also experienced. I will say that it reads like perhaps present day reality, a reality television show, in that it places somebody in an impossible situation to see what they are able and willing to do to survive. Okay, maybe it's like reality TV like that. To put them in a, in a difficult situation, how do they respond? How do they survive? What are they willing to do? So, everybody stay tuned to this show that's unfolding there in Acts chapter 27, and then it spills over into Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of that book. So, the plot line hook is how Paul is a Roman prisoner turned prophetic hero. That's the hook. That's what gets, kind of gets you interested in the story. A Roman prisoner, political prisoner, is now the hero of the story. A, hero is, a heroism unlike the usual heroic myths that would have been bouncing around there for thousands of years in the ancient world where usually there's a foe and an, an enemy that's vanquished by some clim climactic act of violence. That's kind of usually how the hero myths end back then, and I would say probably today. That's how it, that's how it goes. That's the storyline. Instead, the strength of Paul rests in the ballast of Paul's peaceable, even foolish-looking conviction that the God he belongs to and worships, that's what he said, I have a God that I belong to and that I worship, and that's at work here, that this God is somewhere, somehow present and in the midst of their current maritime crisis. And you can kind of see, see people... You can picture them kind of, you know, nodding their heads and, oh, well, okay, all right, all right. Well, that's, that's you, but that's not us. You know, you can kind of get a sense of that maybe. But then the story goes on. Paul is an alternative hero, isn't he? He's different. For Paul, the crisis is not a matter of mutiny and overtaking the power of the ship. Instead, it was an opportune time to exemplify a Christ-centered faith, solidarity with the other passengers. He really was concerned for the, two, the other 276 passengers. Solidarity with them and to demonstrate a heavy reliance upon prayer. That's how it's demonstrated. That's how this alternative hero functions in the world. Interesting. However, beyond the text being just merely Christian missionary history, we can read it on that surface level. Okay, yes, this is 
the first Christian missionary, and this is the history therein. We also can interpret the text in more practical ways. Okay, we understand that this text is at a situation that most of us are never going to encounter in our life. We're not going to be stuck in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, stuck to a ship that is unable to be, unable to be steered and directed. We're not, that's not going to happen. Okay, and what can happen? How, what can we get out of this story? For example, it could be this. What we can do when life's, what we can consider this. What do we do when life's storms come crashing into our lives? That was the story of the boat. That's why I got in that condition. Oh, well, now that you're talking about a storm, as a matter of fact, I'm going through one right now. Or I remember what it's like to go through a storm in life. A story about a sea-battered ship can become a parable for our lives, can it not? To encounter storms in life is to experience the human predicament. We're all, let's just, I'll pull a, bad, a dad joke here, we're all in the same boat when it comes to the human predicament, aren't we? We all know what it's like to go through a storm, for things to go awry to not go as planned. Each one of us understands this, how in the midst of storms there is also the divine presence, and in the midst of storm there are spiritual lessons we could not encounter or learn any other way unless we go through that storm, unless we go through a storm. We're not going to learn it. No matter how many books you read, no matter how many you know, great courses you listen to on your way, on your commute to work. That's not, so, you have to learn that through experience. There is experiential learning that must take place. It's in the midst of storms, rather than fair weather, which we all like, we prefer fair weather. Amen? Amen. But in the midst of storms, we learn the wisdom characteristic of Christ's spirit. That's where we really learn it. Not when it's comfortable and predictable and we kind of give ourselves into the illusion, oh, I'm in control. <laughs> we all operate that way. But then life seems to misbehave and we soon realize we're not in control. Each one of us at some point in life must, must learn the wisdom needed to process a few things. We need to learn to, health, to process in a healthy way undeserved suffering, suffering that we encountered that we didn't deserve it. We've all experienced. To process injustice that happens to us. We are all, we are all touched by this at some point in our lives. To process life's random misfortune, misfortunes and yet remain attached to and in communion with God and others. You know, some people, they, get, they go through life, they go through storms, and then what happens? Uh, typically, I've, I've seen in, 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 some people's, uh, in some people's lives, uh, man, I, I don't want anyone else in my life. I just want to be alone. I just want to move and be alone and live out the rest of my days because I've had it. I've experienced too much in life to where I need to be in, in, in connection with God or others. No, no thanks. Leave me alone. That's some people's approach. That's the outcome for some. To not walk away because of what has happened in life is part of the goal. We all know some people that have jettisoned faith and religious convictions. Get rid of it. Just like the sailors jettisoned the ship's cargo and tackle <laughs> in, in chapter 27, verse 18 and 19. When the storm came, the first thing to, to go was the cargo. Then get rid of the tackle. Well, before you know it, they have no way of steering the ship because of those decisions. 
When the bad times came, that's what happened. They jettisoned stuff. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Well, this may come to well, this these actions may come with some understandable reasons. Understand, I can understand why some people do what they do, what they have done. I can understand it. It's understandable. Speaking as a minister, this is not the hoped for outcome. I would not condone it, but I'm not going to shame and add to a reason why to jettison. Rather, we are to fix our attention on the motions of the love of Christ. Okay, give us an example, Mark, if that's the way it is. In the case of Paul and the ship and the storm at sea, the options left to Paul for him at that time became clear in the story. And I think for Paul, it was this. Sink first. Sink first while you're on a boat that you don't want to sink. <laughs> what I mean by that is this. 18th century Quaker statesman, writer, and poet Isaac Pennington captures the essence of what I believe Paul was acting upon while stranded on that battered, rudderless ship adrift on the Mediterranean Sea almost 2,000 years ago. When Pennington writes this. He writes, give over thine own willing. Give over thine own willing. Give over thine own running. Give over thine own desiring to know or to be anything. Instead, sink down to the seed which God sows in the heart. I'll read that again. Sink down into the seed which God sows in the heart, and let that grow in thee. To the best of my knowledge, Pennington did not write this while trapped on a rudderless ship adrift in the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> but I do know that, know that at times we might want to describe our life in, with words like we would describe that ship where we may feel rudderless, unexpectedly, act, even accidentally set adrift, perhaps fraught with uncertainty, maybe even much afraid. That's how we might describe this season or chapter in life. We'd be able to identify with that ship and what it was going through. Pennington offers mindful Quaker wisdom as an, as an answer to life's randomness and unpredictability. His advice is that, of Paul, is that of Paul's actions of prayer, to sink down into God. Sink down into the seed of God. At a time when everyone in charge on the ship was trying to control and literally batten down the hatches, Paul was busy having mystical experiences. <laughs> he chose to sink into communal intercessory prayer with the Spirit of God. A part of attentive Bible reading is to recognize narrative patterns that start to rise up within the scriptures. Whenever you read the Bible, a lot you start to see, oh my word, I've read this before. This seems to have happened before. I would like to name this event that we were reading, Paul's Gethsemane moment. That's just my title. It's a Gethsemane moment for Paul. The time in life where there's nowhere else to turn but towards God alone. Just as Jesus brought himself in prayer to the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Paul having a similar experience in his hour, in his hour of crisis. Consider how Luke 22, that's the, gar, the Garden of Geth, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane scene, reads in comparison with what we just read in Acts 27. When Jesus prayed the night before his trial and his death, we know these words. 
We recite these words every uh, Holy Week, Good Friday, where Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, not my will, but yours be done. That was the heart of Christ's prayer there in Gethsemane. But then look what happens. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. Wait a minute, didn't I just, didn't we just read that? Isn't that what happened to Paul? An angel of the Lord stood by him and, and gave him a message and encouragement and strengthened him there in the book of Acts. It's almost like the Garden of Gethsemane all over again, but on water, on a cruise ship. <laughs> An angel from heaven appeared to Jesus and gave him strength. And in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly and sweat became like great drops of blood falling on the ground. Mystical experience happening to Christ. At the moment of crisis, at the moment of crisis in, G, in the Jesus tradition, there is intentional, deep prayer, an angelic, an angelic encounter and an encouragement, and then some sort of somatic prophetic experience that happens to Jesus, too. Well, we just saw something a lot like that just happen to Paul when he was in his crisis moment, when he thought death was near to him. Hmm. I want to end on the point of what happens when we actively take Pennington's word for it. We sink down to the seed which God has sown in the heart. What exactly does that mean? What do we mean? It's fun to quote. You almost kind of feel, it just kind of rolls off the tongue. Okay, but what does that mean? What are we practically talking about? What are we saying when we use the word sinking? A very real part of me wants to barge into Pennington's study some two or three hundred years ago when he wrote that. And when he's writing this, I want to say to Pennington, it all sounds very poetic and beautiful, Mr. Pennington. But, this, but let's not forget that sometimes we just need a clear answer about our lives. This is our lives we're talking about, sir. Sinking down into the seed of God that has been sown into the heart. What does that mean? Let's remember that the spiritual wisdom of the ancients and most world religions, not in the least the wisdom of our Savior and teacher, Jesus, they all teach about the power of embracing the paradoxes of life. In one way or another, they finally get around to it, usually out there on the edges of where spirituality in real life you know, starts to get a little bit gray. They start talking about paradox. By paradox, I mean how the passages of life are often accessed counterintuitively, where we've been going forward, maybe we've been going forward this whole time, all my life, but now, surprise, I need to go backward? <laughs> it's counterintuitive. It's being right-handed, but now you're asked to, let, to write with your left. It's different. It's awkward. We're not used to it. I encountered that first when I started learning algebra. Negative numbers? Well, how does that work? <laughs> Counterintuitive is the way of paradox. Seemingly backwards and even upside down. It can be strange how the answers of life puzzles become unlocked and able to move again when we view things differently. And we encounter the role of paradox even in some of the sayings we use with modern proverbial wisdom, we've all, we all know this, less is more. The more things change, the more they stay the same. These are the, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's in the verbiage of today, but we're kind of calling on a paradox to describe a very real living situation. We understand that, we know that. And usually they're just, we just know them as truisms. It's a truism. Yeah, less is more. Okay. 
Paradox has a way of guiding us back to seeing life again in simplified terms. It can help us release our urge to control things. We all know that. It allows us to surrender ourselves ultimately, in Paul's case, to the Lord of life. I surrender. We come to a point of surrender. I can appreciate how the Tao Te Ching frames the, such paradoxical, paradoxical wisdom, where in chapter 76 it reads this way, Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death, the Tao Te Ching would say. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. Again, uh, it's this, this type of wisdom is reiterated. In chapter 43, it says, the gentlest thing in the world overcomes the hardest thing in the world. That which has no substance enters where there is no space. This shows the value of non-action. I'm reading from the Mitchell translation. Paradox and how that plays into life. Paul sinks himself in prayer and intercession for, this, for the ship's passenger's sake. Even experience continued, experiences continued revelation by prophesying how in order for the doomed ship, how for the, in order for the doomed ship and its passengers to suffer no loss in life, the correct action is to stay in the boat. But the ship is doomed. Stay in the boat. We're out of here. Stay in the boat. The paradox? A doomed vessel becomes the raft of salvation for everybody on board. That's a paradox. Here, then, is a parable of the gospel's paradoxical, paradoxical, uh, paradoxical power. The gospel is in this. Do you see it? That the broken body of God's suffering servant has become the means of humanity's collective salvation and reconciliation to God. But it's broken, but it's also resurrected. A beautiful, compelling portrait of the gospel of Jesus. In this story, it's there. How as an act of solidarity in the human, uh, how as an act of solidarity in the story of human weakness, salvation has come and speaks a truthful word of God to our souls. Through the, through the broken body of Christ. It's a paradox that the way forward, the way of life is through something that looks as if that is not the way. And yet it's true. In conclusion, I happened upon words of a song that I have never heard before. I have never, I don't even know the tune of this song. But the lyrics speak a poetic affirmation of how rarely a story is just a story. And that life is more than life, but is in fact the deep, earnest invitation to sink deeply into the seedbed of God's lively and at times paradoxical dream for the world. The name of this song and, the, and uh, the, the lyrics that I'm going to be reading from are from Heather Jocelyn Cranson. The name of the song is, We Praise You, God of Paradox. I've Googled this. I've tried to find it. I can't find it. So if anyone can help me out, that'd be great. <laughs> it reads this way. I'm going, to, I'm going to read the first and the last verse. The lyrics go like this. We praise you, God of Paradox for your incongruous ways. You operate out of the box. You startle and amaze. You yielded to a wrestler's hold. You spoke in hush, not storm. You chose the young son or the old in spite of ancient norm. We praise you, God of paradox, who works with twist and turn, whose endless bounty always shocks you give what we can't earn. Your wisdom sounds like foolishness to those who must save face. 
Make us your fools who do confess your unexpected grace. Let's do our own sinking and let us sink down into the seat of God that has been implanted in our souls. Let us grow, let it grow there. If you feel so moved to share in vocal ministry, we have a microphone. If you feel so moved online, friends online, make sure you're unmuted so we can hear, but let's let our present teacher now speak to us as we sink down and attend to the word of God. Let's center down, friends. Friends online, are we clear? Friends online, uh, FYI, we do see you. Uh, your images are projected. Okay. We do want to just uh, have any items, uh, joys or concerns that would like to be brought to the attention of the meeting for the sake of prayer. Um, uh, I would like us to continue to uh, hold uh, Stu Wilcutts in the light as he is on a healing journey. He is at uh, West Hills uh, Rehabilitation. Um, if, you, if you would want to visit, just go to the front desk and ask for Stu. I'm sure they know his name by, at this point. <laughs> so... Uh, let's remember to uh, Stu in our prayers. Mark? Yes. It's Suzanne again. Hi, Suzanne. So, um, Esmet, one of the um, refugee, Afghan refugee young men that we have been supporting. I can hear the bounce back. Should I stop? Uh, that's on your end. It's not on our end. Okay. Um, he is the gentleman who is in Brazil. And on the 19th, he is going to be interviewed by the French embassy to get, we hope, approval for a student visa to move to France, where he has been accepted at the American University in Paris. So prayers that that interview goes well and he gets a student visa. And then all systems, I think, will be go. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. B. Um, good to have Jonas and Charlene here from up in Spokane. And also Sarah and Kevin and their baby Ruby uh, are here. Uh, Sarah and Kevin and Ruby have moved all the way from Alabama back to Oregon. So we're really glad to have them with us. Newburgh? Currently in Newburgh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I wanted to raise our brothers and sisters on this Pride Sunday that we remember we're all in this together and we are one family and <laughs> God bless us all. I have a neighbor who suddenly lost her adult son. I don't know any details. I just know that she got a phone call from Ohio from her mother. Um, just prayer for her. Her name is Janet. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Lou. 
Ethiopia. I told Teresa, I will try, no cry. <laughs> I asked for pray for a friend. She is in Suriri right now, or oh, later on today. Her name is um, Mari Carmen. And my cousin, she's my best cousin, always draw with her. She has cancer too now, and she has today an MRI and another uh, testing today. She's right now in the hospital doing many tests and see if she needs a surgery or just, you know, uh, we don't know what's going on later on, but she, they want to know what can, type of cancer she has. And I know she's colon cancer, but you know, she had many tests this morning. She's in the hospital right now, so for my friend and my cousin. Thank you. And my cousin name is Evelina. Evelina, okay. Thank you, Olivia. Go, Carol. Oh. <laughs> Um, I, I, something that's been on my heart for like probably, well, eight months now. I grew up in this church and, um, you know, some of the kids that I grew up with are dear to me, even though I have not seen them in a very long time. We haven't been friends as adults, but I would really just like to lift up Jemima Minkus. Um, for those of you know, you know, Carol Minkus, her mother, was a pastor here, um, what, in the 90s, I, I believe. And she is my age, you know, and I think the last time I saw her was probably like seventh grade, but I've been thinking about her so much since she became paralyzed in a car accident in Omaha, Nebraska. She was on her way to you know, she was, I guess, moving to Kentucky to live with her boyfriend as like an elevator repair woman. You know, she was in a union and she is completely paralyzed from the neck down. And she is alone and isolated by herself out there. And I just think about the endless, daunting, soul-crushing experience of waking every day and not knowing what your life is going to be like. And I just really just, could we all just think about her this week and just kind of send her a psychic hug, you know? <laughs> like, anyway, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Sarah. I wonder if that's a, there's an occasion where, you know, even a card, if we could sign a card as, as the meeting and just let her know that she is held uh, by us, okay? And that we are a community that would receive her if she's uh, in whatever way. We have the gift of Zoom, you know, and, and our, a number of people Zoom in from out of state, you know, and I don't know, so let's talk. Yeah, I'd like to ask for prayer for um, Benjamin and Maura, um, <laughs> to a young couple in our Chilean community. Uh, yesterday, Luis, my husband, said, so, um, which usually means something interesting is coming, and we were preparing for soccer tournaments for both kids. You know, it was like, we have 10 minutes. And he said, look, we have someone in, who's recently come from Chile, a young couple, they're in a really hard place. Just a string of misfortune that can happen. And they just slept in their car last night. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if we can have them live with us <laughs> for a while so they can get back on their feet. Um, and we have a small ranch house with one bedroom, <laughs> two bedrooms. Sorry, two bedrooms, one bath, and a finished basement, about 800 square feet. And of course we said yes. We talked to our children and they were all very clear that that would be yes. Uh, 
So we are in this transition and they're wonderful, lovely, lovely humans in a hard place and we've all been there. So just asking for prayers for them. And Rosa, let's be in touch about anything else that Reedwood can do to support uh, this and these friends. Let's recenter and hold the light, friends. Loving God, it is in stories such as the one of Paul stranded at sea that we are, each one of us, deeply reminded of your loving presence and how in the midst of life gone wrong, uh, there too you are working and there too you are um, inviting us to live more deeply, to live more authentically, and to be a demonstration of what it is to be your friend. Light of God, we have heard many names and many situations where these two mentioned were a part of our prayer, or specifically We're specifically thinking of Alina. And we ask, Lord, that you would be present. We ask your presence to abide with Jemima. Lord, that a ministering angel would be sent to speak tender words to her heart. We ask that you would strengthen Rosa and her family and thank you so much that we have in our midst someone willing to open up their house to these guests and therefore fulfilling your call to love their neighbor as you have loved us. We're remembering us met, O oh God, and we ask that way would open for this desired outcome, but also beyond that. It's beyond just the story. Our lives are multidimensional and, as Doug has mentioned, just intertwined, deeply intertwined. So we hold these names, people we know and people we don't know, in your blessed light. And we ask that, Lord, way would open, that blessing and strength and anointing and abiding would continue unto your glory, O oh God. We thank you. We ask these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Um, I want to go ahead and just move on. I know we're over on time, I'm s guys. Uh, just a few announcements here. Uh, Tuesday Bible study. Uh, this Tuesday, we're studying the Gospel of Mark. Uh, that's at 10 a.m. on site here and on Zoom. Uh, also, in two weeks, we're going to have, a, uh, it's going to be the Sunday of guests. We're going to have a, a guest speaker. Um, uh, Gil George, uh, who actually shares some office space with me during the week, 
there. He's going to be uh, bringing the message in two weeks and uh, just looking forward to, uh, to Gil's time of sharing. And then after that, we're going to have our, uh, our um, World Cafe. This is our, th our uh, third uh, installment of our quarterly uh, ministry. And what World Cafe is, it's a time of sharing stories and discovery of people's experience. And we, uh, we have invited uh, Coleman and Qu uh, Quinlan Weimer uh, to zoom in and talk about their experience uh, of a time that they did uh, while they were serving in uh, uh, Israel. And uh, so we're excited to, to, uh, to share on that. They'll be zooming in, like I said, and, but we'll, we'll be in here in this space in two weeks, and that will be from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. So we're looking forward uh, to hearing and connecting there with Coleman and Quinlan uh, that Sunday. Those are just some highlights of things going on here and coming up, and um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, just uh, leave that there as far as announcements. All right, friends, thank you. Uh, online, I, Suzanne, I'm guessing that you're the, you're the uh, online host. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pass things off to you, awesome. And uh, friends online, so good to see all of you and peace unto you. And friends uh, on site, may we walk in peace. Thank mm -hmm. you.